Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We have uh, just a packed house, and it's really exciting to be back at the Montalban Theater with all of you. Four years ago, we began this month, it was four years ago this month, we began our community book club. And every month, we do something extraordinary. We bring Los Angeles together to talk and listen and to laugh. And we welcome authors and newsmakers to help us make sense of the world through intensely personal stories. Stories that tell us something deeper about our nation, our society, and ourselves. We welcome authors like Elliot Page, our special guest this evening. On Tuesday, the Academy Award nominee and star of the Umbrella Academy published Page Boy, which chronicles his long journey to self-acceptance. In Sunday's paper, my colleague, Amy Kaufman, described Page Boy as raw, harrowing, and often heartbreak, also joyful. It's all that for sure. It's also powerful and so incredibly timely. Page Boy arrives in a moment when the trans community in America is under attack, even more so than when he started writing the book just a year ago. I want to share some of his words. Elliot writes, I know books have helped me, saved me even, so perhaps this can help someone feel less alone seen, no matter who they are or what journey they are on. This evening, Elliot Page joins us to talk about his own journey, and we'll be in conversation with Mae Martin. And now, please join me in welcoming Elliot and Mae to the LA Times Book Club stage. love like I feel it I feel it too I really yeah. feel it. <laughs> sending it right back yeah yeah um it's so nice to be here thank you uh I'm thrilled to get a chance to sit down and hang out and okay. talk to you and talk about your book uh who's read the book already are people, people okay spoiler uh <laughs> Elliot's trans um <laughs> Uh, it's so amazing, and I, 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 yeah, I could compliment you a lot for an hour, but I will ask questions, but I, I can't overstate how much I loved it, and uh, as your friend reading it, um, I, you know, I was adding names to my list of enemies, I was getting very riled up, <laughs> but I was, but uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I found it so helpful, so I'm sure other people will as well. Um, I guess... Why don't we start with, <laughs> it wasn't a surprise to me that you wrote a book. I know you, you are very literate and love reading, but I guess why, why now? Like, why did you choose now as the time to, to, to do this? Gosh, I guess um, there's a couple of factors. I mean, one was, quite frankly, before this would have been impossible. It's just, that's just the truth. Before stepping into my truth, before being in this body, I could barely sit down, let alone focus enough to do something like this. So just the feeling of being able to sit and feel creative and have that space was so exhilarating. Like it was uh, as if something clicked and I started writing and could not stop. And then of course, 
as someone who's had this strange journey that's led to this platform that I have in the time that we are facing in regards to the attacks against trans people and queer people and the rhetoric that's just so brutal and harmful um, and in knowing uh, how much books have helped me. Um, it felt like the right time to share my story because, you know, potentially it could, even if it had the, a little bit of the same impact that other stories have had on me, you know, ho hopefully, uh, hopefully that's the, a positive outcome. Yes, unequivocally, yeah. it will have an impact. I mean, I, yeah, I found it so powerful and wished I had had it growing up and yeah, it's, it's so good, but it must have been, so was it daunting? Yeah, it's hard to focus and sit down uh, at all and write when it was all like just a sort of blank page. Was that daunting? How did you know where to start? And I noticed that it's not linear in its storytelling, like it jumps around. It's not like sort of childhood directly to now. It jumps around. Um, how'd you get there? Oh, um, How am I doing, I mean, by the way? Um, <laughs> You're doing so okay, okay. good. Okay, thanks, thanks. I You're really, such you know, a good start. <sighs> like, <laughs> where's the talk show? Um, <laughs> I, would it be honest, it's, I feel like I have a bit of this when things do, I don't know, kind of turn on in my brain and just start. I'm not even always sure I have the answer as to why, but um, my literary agents are fantastic work sort of bringing this up a bit and I was pushing it to the side, like the thought of writing a book, I was a bit overwhelmed. I'd just come out as trans and stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, you, you know, there's a lot, a lot going on. And I was shooting a third season of the Umbrella Academy and I was sort of like, thanks so much. And um, something I was definitely interested in, but just had a lot going on. And so when that wrapped up, I met with them again. And then I just, I was kind of like, you know what? give me a couple weeks and let me put some pages together that we then send out to publishers um, to see you know, interest and whatnot. And I remember just, I walked back to my apartment and I sat down in that first chapter in the book called Paula, it just came out like stream of consciousness and, and what's in the book's pretty similar to, to what I wrote that day. And I just couldn't seem to stop. And in terms of it being nonlinear, I just personally like books that are st structured that way. Yeah. And I think it, at least for me, I don't know if other people agree, uh, in terms of being trans and queer, the experience is nonlinear. <laughs> yeah. Know, we get close to our truth, we pull back, et yeah. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a chapter in the book called you know, U-turn that is sort of about a very specific time around my 30th birthday where I was like, I'm trans. And then I was just like, nope, you know, can't. Yeah. Just, like, just so overwhelmed. in a small box. Yeah, and just, the thought of going yeah. through it, you know, publicly and what that was gonna mean and as an actor and just the whole thing. And so, um, yeah, that's why I sort of chose to approach it in that way and how all these memories interweave and collide. Yeah, I love that chapter, um, U-Turns, uh, and it made me think about, about the pandemic and how it felt like you, you had an opportunity suddenly to sit quietly and reflect, and I, I had the same experience where suddenly like, you're not bumping up against people's perception of you all, as much, and so you kind of have, are able to sit. Did that space and quiet help you? 100%, yeah, yeah. I mean, there wasn't, um you know, I think in the past it was, you know, there was the next job to go do. Yeah. Um, another female role to play. Um, and yeah, how I'd be perceived by people in, in my life or yeah. public or, or what have you. And having that space and time to sit with myself was difficult in many ways. And then yeah. ultimately incredibly rewarding because I was able to get to the place I needed to get to. Yeah, it's yeah. so exciting. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's great. Um, I, yeah, I related a lot, not to make it about me, uh, but <laughs> I related a lot, uh, obviously, as a trans person, but also as a Canadian. I was thrilled. <laughs> are, there, are there Canadians here tonight? You're gonna, okay. It, 
as a Canadian, just the specificity, the ketchup chips, Tim Hortons, um, it, and also we're like the same age. It was just so uh, my my exact childhood, and you write about childhood so vividly. Um, yeah, I think it's very universally uh, accessible that stuff. Um, and you write about Halifax, so I was like shocked by what a huge part Halifax has to play in the book, and the kind of yeah, okay, cool. Um, is that where you were what, mainly when you were writing? Were you on the East Coast? I was, yeah, I was on the East Coast. I was in New York in, in my apartment and then up in Nova Scotia for a bit as well. Right yeah. Now. yeah, it feels like you have a strong relationship with that place though, with Halifax and like, look, if you don't know about the Halifax explosion, you're gonna learn about it in the book. There's some history in there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, there is, to the degree that my editors were like, Elliot, you have to stop writing about the Halifax explosion. <laughs> Um, we're just gonna have to pull that back a touch. Yeah. Uh, so. Also but. some like uh, very idiosyncratic sort of Eastern Canada things like the grease pole. Can, can oh, you yes. explain what the grease pole Gladly. is? Gladly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the grease pole is something that would happen in uh, Lockport, Nova Scotia, which is uh, where my father is uh, from. And very small, predominantly sort of fishing village population, gosh, probably around 600 people. Um, so there was an event called the Grease Pole, which was- Obsessed with the Grease Pole. Which was like kind of at, at the, like on the edge of the wharf, they'd put out a giant pole, um, which they would rub with grease um, and like lard, like, and then put money at the end of it, you know, just sort of, just bills. Yeah, just yeah. bills. And then the, the, the goal was for people to slide out and, and grab the money and as they like plummeted into the, the cold Atlantic. <laughs> I'm obsessed. Um, so that's, I'm like, surely that's the grease bowl. You can't, like the reward can't be worth plummeting into the Atlantic <laughs> off a greasy pole, but like. I mean, I think a lot of it's probably bragging rights, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You'd see different strategies, but the one that typically, uh, worked was just going for it. Like yeah, you couldn't, yeah, yeah. you couldn't just sort of crawl your way out. You just had to whoosh, try to knock off the money and the seagulls are flying around going for the lard. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah. I loved that part. <laughs> I loved it, yeah. You love a grease pole. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we gotta do one. Yeah. Let's do it. Do you think we could do one off like Santa Monica Pier? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think people would come. Yeah. Um, I think I'd feel pretty like gender euphoric, sliding shirtless off a grease pole. Yeah. <laughs> into, <laughs> into the facility. Um, I, well, you, you had sent me, um, I, I think the chapter about Paula when you had just written that chapter and I was so, I mean, I knew that, I know you're a, a great storyteller and very thoughtful person, but you never know what your friend's books are gonna be like. And I was so uh, uh, like wildly impressed by just the quality of your writing and the prose. And I know you referenced um, Kurt Vonnegut in the book, like you love Kurt Vonnegut, but are there any other, yeah, yeah. Uh, are there any other, well, first of all, did you know what your style was as a writer or did you find it as your writing? Uh, and also were there any writers that influenced you? Oh, goodness. I mean, yeah, so I wouldn't even know where to begin and end with that. Um, but yeah, Kurt Vonnegut was really, I wasn't like a big reader when I was like a little kid. I really? wasn't one of those cool kids. It was like, I sat around all the time and read, not me. I played video games and sports and, and we're you know, in movies about that ghosts kind of stuff. And stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And made movies about ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was really at probably the age of like, 14, 15, that I really started to fall in love with write, uh, reading, and Kurt Vonnegut was a big part of that, like yeah. Mother Night and Cat's Cradle. And, um, but, uh, I mean, the, the talk about Maggie Nelson in the book, and Cy Jones, and Alexandra Chi, and Carmen Maria Machado, and I mean, the, just, I, I don't even know. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I would go on and on for, for so long, writers yeah. that I love and whose, um, style and themes and um, yeah that, that have yeah and the epigraph I, I often don't 
notice epigraphs in books, but the epigraph you chose, can I find it? Uh, oh, which yeah. Is Beverly, Beverly Glenn Copeland's. Yeah. Oh, which, Do you know Beverly Glenn Copeland? Uh, yeah. Amazing, yeah. Um, if, uh, amazing is? musician and also beautiful documentary called Keyboard Fantasies made. About I don't know where, oh, wait. Yeah, you, yeah, you've gotta watch that. Yeah. <laughs> Bever <laughs> I used to date Beverly's daughter. In high school. You did? Yeah. Of course yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah. It's a small, Canada's a small country. Who haven't you dated, honestly? <laughs> uh. Canada's small. Um, yeah, but the epigraph is, uh, this world has many ends and beginnings. A cycle ends, will something remain? Maybe a spark, once so bright, will bloom again. Yeah, so beautiful. Um, yeah, what, did, it, did you struggle to choose the opening thing or did you always know that was gonna be your epigraph? No, when it came up, I thought, of Beverly Glenn Copeland or Glenn Copeland, and they go by like in their personal life. And um, I love that song. It's from a song, lyrics from a song called uh, A Song in, in Many Moons. And um, it just really, really spoke to me. I think it, uh, it's, I, I, so much of my life as an adult, I'd find myself going, God, I was never a girl, I'll never be a woman, what am I gonna do? I just wanna be like a 10 year old boy again. And I used to say that so much in like such profound moments of discomfort of not being able to see my future, not understanding why I was in just such profound discomfort all the time. And I realized, oh, that's the last time I felt like myself, the last time I looked like myself and um, had a certain spark Yeah, that Thankfully, now I do feel again, oh. and I just thought, yes. yeah. Um, so that yeah. those lyrics really spoke to me. It's like so hopeful and uh, yeah, beautiful. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> I was I was thinking a lot about something that really. Uh, yeah, was is throughout the book, and I think you feel it if you read it. Is the, the constant sort of fight or flight that that you've had to be in, and that I guess I think visibly queer people can relate to that, and uh, that kind of constant threat of confrontation if you're just going to the bathroom or walking down the street. And uh, I, I'm I guess I'm wondering because yeah, I like as a sort of gender nonconforming person that is so ubiquitous and. How do you now feel, how, how do you make space for yourself to feel safe in your body? Like where do you go that feels safe and where you're like relaxed and taking care of yourself, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's, I mean, I feel like you and I have been out and about and had people like, like it is, um, and then just in reading it, it just, you're like, oh wow, this is even since childhood, like people having, yeah, having issues. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Is, it, is nature a big thing for you? It feels like. Love some nature. Yeah, sure. you love yeah. a bit of a bit of nature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love the nature. Yeah, um, for sure. Being in Nova Scotia in the woods and um, hiking and all of that. But um, what, ask the question again. What uh, did you yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Fair sure. point. Yeah. yeah. Just. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It wasn't much of a question. It was more like a yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, There's, think, yeah, moments of like experiencing like calm and and being out of that state where you're braced for um, yeah, braced for confrontation and and yeah, nature feels like a big part of it. It made me crave nature, um, and the chapter where you go to the the perma culture yeah, to study which is permaculture design. Yeah, how would you explain that? Because that feels like a, a moment where you were able to be really like it's a pretty blissful place. It sounds like yeah. Oh, that's. Yeah, I went there, um, so I went to a place called Lost Valley, which is outside of Eugene, Oregon, um, to study like permaculture design and eco-village development for, you know, it's like a month long course essentially. So I, I was there for some super long time by any means, but that I did pretty much right after shooting Whip It, which was the, the film that I did about roller derby. 
I just don't want to assume that people have like seen everything. I think you can you assume know. people. So yeah. Whip It. This is a warm uh, audience. Which was, and, um, and sort of before Whip It and training for Whip It was the end of like the camp pain award season time for Juno when I wasn't feeling so good, to be honest. Um, not the happiest time of my life. And I think, I mean, that was always uh, the subject matter uh, that really interested in me, interested me, that I wanted to know more about, learn more about. Um, Ecology and yeah, yeah sustainability. You know, sustainability and, um, you know, uh, living in a cyclical way, similar to the planet, uh, basically everything else that's natural on Earth. Um, and uh, I think it was a way to sort of fully disconnect from Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> here we are, here we find ourselves again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I think, yeah, really did allow for some separation and some stillness and where I could maybe feel the closest to myself yeah. that was possible uh, at that time. And that's where you met Ian. That's uh, where I met Ian, and Daniel, on, yeah. yeah. To work the, with and yeah. yeah. Um, that's a beautiful friendship. There's a yeah. lot of, there's a running theme of some very beautiful friendships in here. Um, yeah, I loved reading about uh, Mark who is, who when you had your top surgery, he took care of you and he's kind of, he pops up like throughout your life as just a very sweet, angelic, Boy, and again, not to make it about me, but yeah. when I was in high school, yeah. I knew Mark. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, but this is just a fluke that we both knew him, and I just, the way you describe him is so... How, I, well, I, I remember you had a story about him, like, making something for, was it for you, or who was it? F didn't he... Oh, yeah. What was it that he made I, for you? Well, he used to come over with a... He's a true angel. It's like, he really who is. is this person? Like, yeah, like, he would come over with a bag of spinach and just sort of see, okay. sit and thoughtfully like eat the bag of spinach and then sometimes he'd be like I have an idea for a poem and then he'd write a little poem yeah. <laughs> this is like as a teenager and yeah but we really we'd write poems and be corny together and yeah he was always doing like art projects and stuff but yeah I think that I, the first time that I met you was with Mark in in the yeah when we were both 19 and yeah yeah so it was nice to read by him anyway <laughs> um, can we talk about acting? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Listen, you're, you're great at it. Um, <laughs> and it was, it seems like your relationship with it, it seems like as a young person it was a real escape and a, a place where you could be autonomous, like away from your parents and as a young person, and then your relationship with it changed a bit as like, and the, all the peripheral stuff around it can be so excruciating, but looking forward, like what's your relationship with acting like now? What excites you about it or doesn't, or, yeah. I'm feeling way more excited about it, actually. Um, and I think, but, thanks. Yeah. Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep trying, I'll keep trying. Um, I, you know, in knowing just how embodied I feel now, how present I feel now, the thought of working again and um, is really thrilling to me. And for a while, it wasn't. I was just kind of doing it because that's what I did. Um, and some things, of course, more enjoyable than others, or that. But um, I'm really looking forward to what it's going to mean now in regards to that I feel like I'm getting to start in a grounded place versus, yeah. you know, like you said, this sort of feeling of fight or flight, this sense of always wanting to flee your body. It's not a great place to, you know. Oh, hey, you too. Cool. Um, it's so it's to then if to then already... to get to start from a place that's you know, actually centered and present, because to me it's a work that, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's funny because the work, you are escaping, you're sort of uh, creating this, pardon the pun, but like a transcendent moment with another person. I mean, it's, yeah. I love it. Um, but, but you have to but be. But you, the point is like, to be as present as possible, to be in that space and, and create those moments and. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and to be, if you're already feeling sort of vulnerable and guarded, to then have to be further vulnerable. Yeah, I feel like it might be a totally different experience now. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And cool. just to feel better at work, you know, versus yeah. like being horribly uncomfortable all the time or... Yeah. Um, and it was getting to the point, like when I did sign on to Umbrella Academy, I remember saying to the showrunner, Steve Blackman, like, I really want to do this, but I have to be able to choose what I'm going to wear because I can't be in certain clothes potentially for years. I can't do it. Like, it was yeah. getting to the point where even going into projects, it was like, you have to put in my contract. Yes. I'm, I'm going to have to, I can't wear remotely feminine clothing. Like, it was yeah. just getting more and more intense. And thankfully, I was able to start walking into a wardrobe fitting and being like, so I'm gonna have to wear really tight sports bras, just so you know, yeah. you know. But being able to just say it, you know. I don't know why I just yelled that. But yeah. No, it's good, yeah, yeah. yeah. We should yeah. be yelling more. Uh, I think, um, and yeah, then, yeah. There, there was so much, like, I, 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 I really hope that uh, cis people read this and can sort of understand that feeling better, because I've also had people be like, but you're an actor and you, you know, it's just clothes and it's like, it's very hard to explain that feeling of like how excruciating it can be and that level of, uh, yeah, so I really hope, I think it'll be very illuminating for people who haven't had that experience, who are like, yeah, but it's just, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about love. Listen, there it's, you're, I, I know you're, you're, a, you're a romantic, I'm romantic. There's a lot of love in this book. Um, it, it's hot. It's so hot. Thanks. I, you guys have to get the uh, audio book um, <laughs> because <laughs> I absolutely loved it, and it's so great to, to have that kind of content out there as well. But you you, uh, you write. A, there's a line about love that I found very compelling and relatable, which is, if existing in your body feels unbearable, love can be an irresistible escape. I loved that. I, and I was wondering, in writing, did it make you reframe any of your, did you, in processing those things and writing them, did it make you reframe those relationships at all? And, and was it helpful to process kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it was, um, in many ways, humbling as well, because <laughs> I go, might like write a bit or write a draft and go, huh, Elliot, that sounds a little angry and self-righteous. Yeah. <laughs> and then like really learn to look at my own behavior, my own role in things, um, which, you know, wasn't always cute or was <laughs> <laughs> a bit selfish or um, just not taking you know, responsibility or ownership over my role in certain situations. And I found that really valuable. I feel like you always take so much ownership and responsibility. Um, yeah, I, do you feel like in a, diff a different place when it comes to love now, like than these previous, yes, yes. I do. I think in the past, I'm sure many people can relate to this, I just couldn't be alone. I just couldn't. I didn't know how to function by myself. I really didn't. Yeah. And I think it's not that I didn't feel, you know, love and care and all those things, but a, a part of it I do think was like I needed to cling to someone. Yeah. Because I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And it gave me a sense of comfort and safety. Um, That's partly being in your 20s too, I think. We're all right. just like <laughs> desperately yeah. like... Yeah. clinging to each other and hurting each other so badly, everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's it, it, you write about it so beautifully and with so much uh, empathy and, and love for everybody that you write about in the book. And I loved when you were talking about your, your stepbrother and, and his evolution and, and you write with so much love for him. And was that important to you to show like, yeah, or that, that people can change and grow? It felt like you have a lot of compassion there. Um, absolutely, and I think we all change and grow and learn new things, and you know, not me, that, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> except for except for me. Yeah, um, uh, I have zero compassion for you. Yeah, but, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. And um, but yeah, absolutely, and you know, um, in terms of like my mother's journey and how I write about her in the book and. Um, she didn't have an easy time with my queerness and whatnot, so that took a second. But she's 
grown so much and yeah. her relationships the best it's ever been couldn't be more of an ally educates herself she's like you know like yeah. yes yeah yeah um so i yeah to me that was a was a important thing to to write about yeah or oh, like what how like memory is so weird and she's like I remember that conversation walking in the park and you're like ah, that's not where it happened or how it happened but yeah. it's if, I it's think like, people no, just no you screamed at me in a car but that's yeah really you're like this is a nice <laughs> fantasy yeah. you've created but, but I love you yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about Mo's role in writing the book uh, your dog Mo who's yeah. truly an angel uh like Mark, <laughs> there's, yeah. Uh, Honestly, I I know their name names both start with M. Yeah. But I really don't think because you your name starts with an M too, and I'm never calling him in May. No offense. Yeah. But I'm calling Mo Mark all the time, and Mark really? Mo. It's very strange. They're both like your little sidekick from the yeah. Movies. It's weird. <laughs> they have like a similar look. Too, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Um, was Mo sort of by your side through the writing process? He was, he's pretty upset he's not in the book more. But, yeah, uh, I was gonna say, yeah. He's writing his own book right now. <laughs> I know, he knows all my secrets. Oh my God, that could be incriminating. Oh, he yeah. knows some secrets. Um, A tell-all. Yeah, <laughs> no, he's, uh, he's the best, I'm so lucky. Yeah. I think I'm gonna get a dog. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, um, yeah, how, how, how has it been pr promoting the book for you? Uh, how, how are you doing with promoting? I know it's intense, like writing something so personal and then it sometimes feels like everyone's like, and now be more personal and give us more of, and you're like, that's all, you know, I've just done that. But um, yeah, how has it been? How are you navigating that? <laughs> um, I think uh, it was more the, the lead up, quite frankly, because writing a book is, I mean, it's, I really, I did thoroughly enjoy the experience. I found it cathartic and healing, and, but also naturally intense in moments um, and overwhelming in moments, of course. But it, yeah, it's intense. And then, the, you know, in the like last minute of the edit, uh, it, it, you're just going and going nonstop. And like, the clock is ticking and then it just stops. And you're like, mm. okay, I'll just sit here as I wait for this to go out into the world. Um, so it's, it's more like now that it's actually out, you're kind of like, okay, yeah, well, yeah. What else could I possibly? What else can I possibly yeah. say? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, was but, there anything that you were super excited about? A, a particular story that you were excited about sharing with people, or that, uh, or or very nervous about sharing with people, like one in particular. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I'm. I'll tell you mine. Okay. Uh, there, when you talk about filming Whip It, you talk about you and Kristen Wiig um, <laughs> writing a musical uh, called The In... The Unidentified the Beast. The Unidentified Beast. Yeah. And it's now all I can think about since reading it, I'm like, you've got to make that musical. It's based on, there was a news article about something that washed up on shore and was just like an unidentifiable beast. Yeah, we were shooting Whip It. Yeah. And, um, we were having a lot of fun, but also pretty, you know, it was tiring, obviously. You're like on skates all day and uh, doing intense roller derby scenes. Um, and there was an article, or we're really talking about this, okay. And so then yeah. there was an article about this unidentified piece <laughs> that washed up on the shore in Montauk. And for whatever reason, Kristen and I became abnormally obsessed with this and slightly like delirious with fatigue, would just like skate around between takes and be like, the unidentified beast. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you gotta make it. It's I was a hit. gonna like play like, like this kid who wanted to like go help the un unidentified beast. And she was like the mother who like wouldn't let me go. And it was very <laughs> like we were creating this it's the best. We were, I think we were a, 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 a tad fatigued. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, maybe we should make it. We were thinking like Paul Rudd for the she, sea ship captain. Yeah. yeah. Get like Lin-Manuel Casting Miranda was happening. To, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I'll play the beast. Yeah. <laughs> I'll play the corpse of the beast. Yeah. Um, yeah, I loved... Well, Actually, I'll, it's something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'll play the blob on the beach. Yeah, like um, yeah, and I loved the way you wrote about uh, Catherine Keener as well, and a lot of kind of, uh, like, mentorish figures in your life that, that were, um, like, safe havens for you. And, uh, yeah, no question there. Just, that's very nice. Well, we all, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Keener's amazing. She's been one of the most special people to me in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. First tattoo, is that right? First tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Um, I mean, look, I'm covered in pages. I don't. I don't. I. I feel like we could. We could maybe soon go to audience questions. I know people have submitted questions. Um, but is there anything you'd like to say to me? <laughs> <laughs> or is there anything that you wish I'd? Ask? You know what? I am gonna say something to you. Yeah. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. And because I don't know, like, how much we've really talked about this, but how. Um, important you and your honesty and your candidness in your work oh. and in your show really, really helped me to get to where I am. Oh, man. Yeah. That's really, really nice. Thanks. Um, well, right, yeah, right back at you. Genuinely, uh, yeah, right back at you. I feel like the first time that we reconnected, like, we were both not in a great place and then seeing you just a year later and, I, and like, it's just amazing to see and uh, it's invaluable to have someone I can talk to about these very specific experiences and that I feel I also have. So thank you and for your openness and honesty and bravery and it's no small feat to be like, yeah. Uh, especially now in the world, a scary time. <laughs>